Excuse me, I'm next in line. Move. Excuse me, I'm next in line. Watch out. Excuse me, I'm next in line. I said move. Excuse me. Welcome, folks, to another episode of Will's Review. I'm your host, Will D. And some of you who've been listening to the radio have been hearing our uh, audio testing, so I hope you enjoyed the ridiculousness I put on the wave. And the rest of you will be tuning in to our regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> so we're going to start off with some sports real quick. There's a lot going on because it's that one time of year that every sport actually plays, the ending of October. So uh, first we're going to start off with uh, hockey. Hockey, we have the Islanders second in their division. Uh, we have the Rangers second to last in the same division, and the Devils dead last in the division. That's, that's all we need to talk about there, because when the Islanders are winning, New York isn't winning a championship. Next, uh, basketball. The Nets are 2-4, and four, and the Knicks are 1-5. and five. Now, it's really early in the season, so although this sounds like damn, the Nets are literally like two games out of being in the playoffs at this point, because a lot of the East Coast is not having winning records. And it makes sense because this is basketball on the West Coast for the last, what, five, ten years, is dominating with winning records. So if they're winning, someone's losing. Uh, as far as the West Coast, I mean, the most impressive thing people are still talking about is the Clippers being the Lakers without Paul George. And, you know, there are a lot of different highlights over the last you know, week or so, but with that being a thing that's happened this early in the season, I think the Clippers are favorited right now. Also, Golden State's really slow demise from being champions to what they currently are is also mildly depressing. But I still have you know, faith in Curry to possibly take his team to the playoffs because he's freaking Steph Curry. He already has done everything we thought no one else could do. Um, we have football going on, and on that front, the Giants are 2-6, and six, but their division is so bad, they're only three games out of first place. I feel like the NFC East could be very well an 8-8 eight and eight by the end of this season with their team getting into the playoffs. So the Giants still have hope because everybody sucks there. Um, the Jets are losing. They only have one win this season, so they're dead last in their division. The Bills, who are in the same division, and technically the only New York team that plays in New York, are 6-2, and two, putting them two games out of first place in the divisions behind the unbeatable Patriots this season, as well as making them the first team in the wild card. So as of now, the Bills are in the playoffs. Um, and last but not least, congrats to the Nationals for winning the World Series. That, I, you know, nobody really cared for here because it's New York. Although, I can take a little bit of happiness in this because even when they were the Expos, they always had a bit of a rivalry with the Mets, so the team that the Mets hate won a championship. I can enjoy that to a very, very small degree because I'm, I'm less of a Met hater and more of a Yankee supporter. I understand that, but just because Mets fans were all laughing at us when the Yanks didn't get to the World Series, your rivals won everything, so screw you. Uh, on that note, we're going to go to our first commercial break. When we come back, there's a lot of stuff to catch up on and a lot of, of movies to get to. Let's go. Well invested, I was born and I'm born with the weaponry. You got 
live, I see that Whoever the one on me, you wouldn't achieve that Look, it's how I'm made, a renegade, never catch a fade Got it made, like special and over ace of spades Let the drama slide, the truth like very time My word is my bond, y'all see what I'm on Philly style, draw like Picasso, a wonderful enemies I got close Friend of foe, which one do you know? Say your biz and the actors go to show what happens, tell me who will know Cause we'll see it all when it's all time to go Switch the fuck, don't stitch it Hard you gotta get me to hard I believe the boy told me that more than one Yo, I'm done talking, no words, all actions Like, like you said all the words, words all like Face like, wow, what happened? People hit the fan, I can see you with my man The evils of your plan, you can see the get me can Your reason it was wow. plain, but the feeling like of your hand I love you like <laughs> silver, keep the evil when it lands I can see you with my face, but I wouldn't understand You knew you were wrong, I won't sing the same song No fun, you promise, it's a shame Cause I'm brutally honest, my mind is the flower of blue my line of goes to the tomb, you're a fool to assume Anything different, I'm on point like tip You can't go kick it, listen Message sent, you best perceive it From yours truly, the world will know Leaks, kid Friend of foe, which one do you know? Take your biz and the actors go to show What happens, tell me who will know Cause we'll see it all when it's all time to go stuff going on the first thing i want to get to because i was just on instagram was that facebook and instagram have both started to ban without any warning emoji use for sexual solicitation but why do i bring this up so we're, we're talking about the eggplant we're talking about the squirt sign we're talking about the peach you know and if you don't know what they stand for do you live on a rock uh but but frankly the, the website is saying that you can still use these things right even even for innuendo, but the moment that it becomes, can you send me a picture of your this or that, or you know, it'll this will only cost you. If it sounds like you're you know someone is making an ask or a sell, Facebook is gonna ban it, ban the posting, ban the ban the the, the message. To which a lot of people are kind of like, uh, I guess I care, <laughs> because no one seemed to have noticed this was a thing yet. Um, this literally happened, I think, on the 29th, on, on um, October 29th. And there are, like, very few people who did. I know there are a bunch of girls who are happy about this, more so than guys. But it's kind of one of those just, like, man, who cares? We'll figure out something else because that's what people do. It's like, you know, the meme that I posted. When Boston takes away the B word, there's the C word. That's just kind of how this stuff works, guys. Uh, next, there's... This, this, I, I don't know if this is real news or fake news, but it's from Hustler.com, so probably fake news. But I found it to be a story that was worthy enough of mention that a Crip gang member in California had his first taste of red Kool-Aid and immediately decided to stop gangbanging. <laughs> <laughs> Now, according to this gentleman, right, you know, he's been blue his entire life, and, you know, they go hard where they don't mess with nothing of the wrong color and things like that. So after having his first taste of red Kool-Aid as an adult, he now, this is, this, is my, this is my quote of 2019, denying a man of red Kool-Aid is like getting head with a condom on. Not fair. <laughs> right? <laughs> this comes from Carlos, the man who left the Crips because he enjoyed red Kool-Aid. 
Honestly, I, 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 even if this is a made-up story, I don't know if it's real or fake. It sounds completely fake to me. But whoever wrote this is so creative that this, this had to be brought up this particular week on the show. And, and honestly, this is the best quote of 2019. I've heard a lot of dumb things said, but this right here, because you can't even be mad at it. I think every guy can kind of relate to it. You know what? I understand why you like Kool-Aid now. Other Crips have, would believe that, oh, you know what? If that's how you really feel, brother, peace out. <laughs> so, yeah. So, that, that's one of the, the newsworthy stories I found this week. In actual news, though, uh, Marvel has officially said that production on Into the Spider-Verse 2, though that's not the given title, it's just what they're working with for now, has begun. So, there will be another animated Miles Morales movie which I think a lot of us are looking very much forward to, considering how amazing the last one was. Um, also, Trump can't catch a break, right? You know, people are talking about impeaching him. It's actually become official. People realize that, you know, he, he's, you know, moving money illegally. So he thought he was going to get a gimme, right? He was just like, we're going to force immigrants to prove they have health care so this way, you know, and, and the courts were just like, no. Stop picking on the immigrants. We're, we're tired of you right now. Like, we're really tired of you right now. When the courts who are on your side by party have to start telling you, like, this is bad, no. <laughs> Donald Trump can't catch a break. So that, that's the thing. However, there, there's, there's been evidence shown to me recently from a rally on October 17th, right? For the last month or two, especially since the... Um, the whistleblower thing has come out. There have been news reports from mostly Democratic stations that Trump has been losing support um, and that a lot of his rallies are empty. And I have seen video evidence from a rally on the 17th showing an array of colors and people out at support for at a Trump rally. So, all I will tell you about this particular situation is despite all the crap that this man is doing, he still has a very large, crazy, supportive following. Democrats. No, no, Democrats. Please, please, please stop taking chances, right? And coming up with alternatives and trying to appeal to these, these crazy liberals. Put an old white man in office that has a family. That's it. That's all you got to do. You want to you run America, just use an old white guy. Even for four years. But just get him in there and get this guy out. That's all I'm telling you. Don't want to believe me. Look what happened when I told you Hillary was going to lose. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. I called it. I said Trump was going to win. Everyone doubted me. They doubted how much they were willing to let Russia rig the elections. That's all, that's all I'm saying. Put an old white guy in office. That's, that's the only way you're going to win. Uh, Netflix is about to launch a, a new scope on anime to their uh, collection. So just to give you a look at what's to come announced for 2020 so far, there's a new series called Loving, and it's pretty much like another mech boxing thing where people have this stuff ingrained in them and they're fighting each other with these you know cybernetically enhanced bodies we literally just watched that in megalobox so i don't know how audiences will feel like if they're going to compare the two from what i've seen of this current series and it should be released actually in the next few weeks um it it's vastly done like vastly different as far as the animation style so I'm thinking we're going to get way more of a tribute series like Megalobox was for Joe the Boxer and more of an original, this may feel more like Hajime no Ippo. Uh, for those of you who watch anime, that will mean something. Uh, Hajime no Ippo is probably the most, or one of the longest running series in Japan and like they still have weekly updates over a thousand chapters kind of situation. Uh, so it's very popular, it's very old, and this is going to be the next version of that. Um, there's a current series that I'm actually going to talk about a little later called Psyche K. They're getting a sequel that will come out on Netflix later this year. Uh, Alter Carbon, another show that we talked about in the past, will be getting another season, and a, uh, as well as a side story season coming up in 2020. So something to look forward to if you were a fan of Alter Carbon. I know I mentioned that it's a 
you know, meh series, it insists upon itself. But there are some diehard fans to it because they like that weird sci-fi feel in their anime. Um, there's a series coming out that's about humans turning into giant insects called Kaga Star of an Insect Cage. I'm not sure what more this is about because that's all I could find out about it. Humans fighting humans who get turned into insects due to some disease or something like that. I don't know where they're going with that, but as strange of a concept as it sounds like, because it's an anime, I have a feeling it's going to be really deep. Like, way beyond just people fighting people turning into monsters. So, look forward to that one. Uh, the series I'm actually looking the most forward to is something that's really cute, charming, feels very Studio Ghibli. It's called Eden. It takes place far in the future, in a place called Eden 3, and it's about robots who accidentally wake up a, cryo, uh, a cryostasis human and start to learn that a lot of the myths that they had about humans were wrong. And it's a little girl, and it looks like one of those little, like, adorable, like, Ponyo, Tiki's Delivery Service, that sort of thing. Like, I'm really excited for it, because it looks like a, an awesome, amazing, like, story to be told. Um, there's a, a story called Japanese Shine, which is based off of a, a manga series. And last but not least, I feel like a lot of people are going to be excited for this, but it's a sequel to Ghost in the Shell. And not just Ghost in the Shell, but Ghost in the Shell SAC, which is a, like, fan favorite. So it's going to be something that's going to be exclusive to Netflix. It's going to be very interesting to watch. I hope you guys enjoy it. Because um, I was a, a huge Ghost in the Shell fan growing up. And I know a lot of people feel funny about the uh, series that uh, Scarlett Johansson did. Let it rock. She, she did a solid job. And they actually d didn't go too far off of the, the manga. So I'm not hating on them. But what I want to get to is wrestling. Why? Because it's getting really mm, awkward. Let's get ready to rumble! I wish that were the case, because did you not see that event in Saudi Arabia? I've, okay, so this... Exactly. Like, this, this thing, every year, every year to me is one of the worst pay-per-views. Right? Now, I personally don't even have an issue with Mansoor, but... This is a guy, so every year at this, what, what, what do they call this thing? Uh, the, the, the main event. I forget what the name of it is. It's because it just annoys me whenever they do it. I, I don't know why I keep watching it. Um, but every, every year that they, they go to Saudi Arabia, right? They try to make the world's greatest something, right? So you had the world's greatest Royal oh, Rumble. No, no, no. The world, so you did the world's greatest Royal Rumble. You had the, um, the world's greatest wrestler when Shane did that whole bit for a year. You just now did the world's greatest tag team. Um, so, you know, that, that seems to be the big gimmick of the event. And I have no issue with it, right? Like, um, even the year that Mansoor won the Royal Rumble, right? Which I thought was, it was a dope thing because he was just really coming into NXT. I feel like he's underutilized anyway because he, he does have a very versatile array of moves. But you know when they go to this event, Mansoor is going to win because he's the local Saudi boy. However... This, this particular time, they have him go up against Cesaro, who is legitimately a great wrestler. He should have been a, a champion for the whole entire WWE, but they kept screwing him out of that. Um, and now he's not, he's not going to be given that push because he, he was away for a long time. Um, and so they had Mansoor versus Cesaro, and of course Mansoor wins because they're in Saudi Arabia. And he has the nerve to say, this was the most important match of my career. After he just won, like, the world's greatest Royal Rumble, how long ago? Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? It just didn't make any sense. Uh, you have Brock Lesnar and Cain Velasquez getting into a weird match, which was, like, fake MMA, but not really. And then I'm hearing that Cain actually signed a multi-year deal with them. So that's going to get interesting, maybe, because both of them have other crap that they're doing. Uh, <laughs> uh, then I, I hear Ronda Rousey's coming back. Uh, WWE just seems like they're desperate to just make moves at this point. The desperate. Old, <laughs> That's a word. I mean, we have <laughs> Friday Night SmackDown. The reason why Friday Night SmackDown moved in the first place was because ratings are hard to get on a Friday night. Why? People go outside on a Friday night. I've consistently had to watch SmackDown on Hulu two days later. You know what I'm saying? Because I go out on Friday nights. I barely have a life, but I find time on Friday night. Um, then you have a oh, you have AEW versus NXT, and it seems like they're alternating who's getting the extra time slot. 
Like, they've yet to really go head-to-head -head where they only show their show once. And what AEW has that, that NXT doesn't is that they don't have an online network you can watch them on after the fact. So NXT is not going to have the super high ratings or even comparable ratings because a lot of wrestling fans who will watch NXT, because legitimately it's, it's entertaining, are going to have to watch AEW live and catch NXT a day or two later on the network. I think it's a good move for the network because they went their their last quarter the, the network went down nine percent as far as subscriptions. So they need their subscriptions to go back up, and this will give people a reason. DVR. But it's gonna but it's gonna hurt as far as their live viewership for the head to head, and they're gonna lose the ones that are not showdowns. And let's not forget that Impact Wrestling has not given up. They found somebody to pick them up, and they just came back. So they took the one night that there's no other show because Thursdays is still supposed to be NXT uh, UK. So they took Tuesday and said, we're going to do that. And they, they are starting to actually integrate. They're the first televised brand to really integrate intergender wrestling. Because Tessa Blanchard is about to mess with the guy who they, uh, Sammy Callahan, who they just gave their Impact Championship to. So that, they could be the first televised league to have a female be their champion champion. Not their women's champion, the champion of the men and women. So think about that. A lot of moves being done there. And WWE is shook. They're shook right now. All I know is... I think that's why he's pushing the uh, football. Oh, he's, yeah, he's trying to bring back the yeah, XFL, he's, right? He's, pushing he's like, I want to make sure I have money somewhere. Look, I think they did a very smart as far as booking, but poor as far as booking move by bringing NXT people to SmackDown. I think that could have that been well played if they actually let SmackDown win a match. <laughs> See, and, and why do I say that? Because in general, people look at SmackDown nowadays. Now, this is back when the, when the Rock and The Undertaker were the face of SmackDown, and they were versus Kane and Triple H and all those guys on Raw. SmackDown over the years has become the secondary brand. Automatically. SmackDown versus Raw was cool because you had top-notch stars. Like, you felt like your World Heavyweight Champion was equivalent to your WWE Champion. Right? Nowadays, it's the universal title that makes more sense than the WWE. And it's not because it's the universal title. It's just because it's on Raw. Right? It has to be more relevant because it's on Raw. Why do people care more about the Intercontinental Championship than the United States Championship? It's on Raw. Vince, if you want to do yourself a service, you have to build SmackDown to not be the second brand. Not because it's two hours compared to the three. No. You have to build SmackDown to be a standalone brand. Give it a reason why you have separate rosters. They could all be WWE, but Raw and SmackDown need to separate. They need to go back into war. Survivor Series is at the end of this month, and it is your golden opportunity to build up NXT, but to also build up SmackDown. NXT is its own league, and it always has been. It was always the minor league, so they have a lot to prove. I think that Kevin Owens made that transition and made NXT possible in doing that when he was NXT champion and beat the crap out of Cena. When he came straight out of NXT and took the title from Cena, from your face of the company, he came and he made waves. You know, Seth Rollins is the NXT, was the first NXT champion, or, you know, and, and is now running your league. Like, you have people who've made this statement. You had Finn Balor go back to NXT, which I thought was a brilliant move because he was being wasted on the Raw roster. There's a lot building for NXT, but you keep forgetting about SmackDown, and it's very, very important. It needs to stop being the gimmick brand, mm -hmm. and it needs to be its own legitimate show. Put some of the heavyweights on there. The same way that you talk about them on, on Raw, that's what you need to do. On that note, we're going to go to our next commercial break, and when we come back, it's movie time. <laughs> you make things. There we go. Yo, I'm rapping to like a laryngitis. If you want it front, we ain't putting that behind us. You couldn't find us when it's over a thousand meters. But not because the coordinates to the location we reside in. I'm a boss. Yep, in any contest, we.
you should be skipping. And one of the first ones I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about is because I had a lot of high hopes for this. This looked really cool, and I, I love the concept of when um, you know people will take a comic or a movie or something and just kind of turn it into a music video, right? Or long whatever. Even when Kanye dropped that album, that was like one long music video. It was dope. He was telling a story in this. So uh, Sturgill, uh, I think it's Sturgill Simpson, Soul and or Sound and Fury. Is the, is the name of it. It's on Netflix. And this series looks so dope. Even the front cover looks so dope. Now, this is based off of a, a comic from Sturgill Simpson. And I looked into the comic, and it says dope. It's a really dope concept. I, I, I read maybe a chapter or two, and was like, oh, this is actually entertaining. But the movie is just really, like, it doesn't, it doesn't tell the story of the comic in full. It's very weird. Some of the songs don't feel like the same vibe. It just, I don't, it's about 40 minutes of me just kind of wondering, like, why the hell am I watching this? The only reason I will give this above a 1 as a 2 out of 5 is just because some of the art conceptually, like, on its own, if we, even if we take it song by song, it's kind of cool. So, like, that, the, the actual graphics of it are awesome. But when you're thinking about sitting here for 40 minutes, if this was maybe a three-minute AMV for one of the songs, I think I would have enjoyed it. But really sitting there as this is supposed to be one continuous story being told for 40 minutes, I was like, nah, this is, this is whack. The only reason I got through all of it is that it was the only thing I had downloaded that morning in so much anticipation for it to be good while I'm on my way to work that I had nothing else to watch. So, you know, I, I, I toughed it out. I did. And I can't say I regret it. But I definitely could have done my time better reading manga. Um, next is another series that eh, from Netflix called The King. It's a new, it's a new movie that just came out um, on Netflix. Not to say it's a brand new movie, but it just came out on Netflix. And essentially it's about a guy who is thrust into the mantle of ruling an empire he once worked for. You know, um, it's not a bad movie. It's just a movie that we've all literally seen before. The acting's not bad either. It's just I've seen it too many times before to really care. Like, I felt like, oh, so this is going to happen, and this and that. Oh, at least the fight was cool. Like, I, th there was no real emotion invoked because of this movie, and I feel like if you enjoy the, these time period pieces, you can watch it because you just enjoy it. The type, if it's something that you, you just watch it because you were hoping it was good, it's something you've seen before. So it's a 2.5. I'm not going to tell you you need to skip it, but you definitely don't need to watch it. Um, now, the next one I have to say is along the same lines, and it's a 2.5 out of 5, is the new Terminator movie. Now, I, too knew better than to have amazing hopes for this movie from the moment they were talking about it as a huge feminist statement. I was happily surprised that as the movie started off, it didn't feel like a huge feminist statement until about the last half hour. Now, let, let, me, let me explain how this works without ruining the movie. So first and foremost, I want to say the only reason that this movie is a 2.5 and not a 2 is because even based on convoluted Terminator timeline logic, this legitimately should be Arnold Schwarzenegger's last Terminator, the same way that this should really be the last Rambo. Um, and so as a Arnold fan, as a Terminator fan, I believe you can get through this movie and, and, you, should, and you should watch it. If you are not an Arnold fan or a Terminator fan, skip it. That's why it's a 2.5. But just because of Arnold factor, it's a 2.5. Um, anywho, they found a way to work him into the story seamlessly, and it kind of worked. A little bit convoluted if you think about how timelines work, but in the end, it actually logically makes sense. You just have to you know, be used to Flash. Um, <laughs> uh, time traveling is always complicated. Then you f there's a major twist in the movie about why one of the characters is there. And let's just say it's not believable. I don't believe this person can lead an entire rebellion against an, a, a, a giant army in, of, of machine invading 
the world, right? I just I don't I don't see this person at all. Not physically, not because of the the acting was very poor. I felt like when they told me there was Diego, I was looking at Dora. Right? I'm, I'll leave it at that. Um, and then to tell me that Dora is going to save the world. Okay. All right. I'll I'll even eat that because your explanation made sense. But then in the end, when you when you make a twist like that, no, I don't believe it at all. Uh, and and for me to say that something in Terminator is unbelievable really means how bad it was. I love Terminator. It's a really simple action movie. They try really hard to make it like deeper than it is. And you know what? Because they tried, I I love it. This movie like single-handedly, uh, in, in 30 minutes, in 30 minutes, ruined itself. Not to say it was an amazing, but they, they're calling it the best Terminator since T2. No, it's definitely not. And T2 is definitely the best Terminator. I don't care what anybody says. Like, that definitively is the best Terminator. It's one of the few times that the sequel, the second sequel, is actually better than the first movie or the third. Very rare that happens. This is true. This last Terminator movie, it is really bleh. At least Sarah Connors was a badass in this movie. That's the one of the two redeeming factors besides Arnold being, well, Arnold. Um, and he's actually really funny. This is, they, they made Terminator really funny. That's probably the only thing that was, was similar to Terminator 2. That the Terminator was actually funny. So uh, just, just skip that. Just please skip that. Unless you are a Terminator fan, then you have to see it as Arnold's last movie. Next is a series called Psyche K. Essentially, it's about a boy who has all the dopest powers ever imaginable, uh, but he has a low tolerance for human beings and a high popularity. So how do you mix being like the strongest human ever and not wanting to be and being around them while you're constantly drawing them in? And it's a bunch of these disastrous stories as he's trying to get through high school unnoticed, but he's so special he just can't. It's one of those really random Japanese comedies that has an interesting concept. For me, it's not my kind of humor. I, when I like a, a Japanese humor thing, it's normally more of a pervy series. It's called Echi. Uh, and it, it's more that kind of like ha-ha middle school funny. This is more so really silly, gimmicky, like if you like kid TV show kind of stuff, uh, that sort of thing. Or if, or if you can really relate to the fact that you find people annoying but you can't help, but help them out. Yeah, then this is the, you'll feel so related to the main character of this. Um, it's not a bad show, but it's you know it's a three out of five. It's something that you know is it's for an acquired taste. He has antennas. He has antennas to block out his some of his telekinetic abilities, like how Charles has Cerebro. Yeah, um, but he uh, also uses his powers to warp people's mind so they don't think that his antennas are weird, as he's the only person in the world wearing them. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's a very it's it's a very intricate show. It's it's, it's conceptually very good, but. Yeah, it's one of those. Uh, also, in this realm of maybe, maybe not, are two things. You have The Last Kids on Earth, which I think is a really good animated show for kids. Adults, I feel, will be 50-50, thus the 3.5. Uh, essentially, it's about a bunch of kids who have survived a weird apocalypse and now live around monsters, and a boy who is obsessed with saving the girl of his dreams and hanging out with his friends along the way. It's a lot of fun, a lot of good humor, and it's a really good, like I think, teen show. Um, and I feel like, you know, adult adults, if you're a parent, you're, you're not really going to dig it too much. But unless you're a big kid like me, then you'll enjoy it like you were, you know, a 15-year-old kid. Uh, uh, as well as Arsenio Hall's Smart and Classy. This isn't a bad comedy show. It's not. If you hold the show on its own, it is a good show. It's just about 20 years too late. I feel like this is like watching certain episodes of Family Guy. And you were you just weren't born in the '80s, you know. You you didn't live through the '80s. You didn't live through the '90s. Or if you did, you were so young that you don't remember the adult version of those of those years. And that's his comedy. I feel like he added in a couple of jokes about how comedy is hard to do in the modern era, and he pretty much just cracked jokes on people who were relevant 20, 30 years ago. And the audience that was there had to be at least 30 and up because they found it funny. But I know a lot of people who'd be like, "So who is he talking about right now?" Like, I don't know who's cracking jokes on Mike Tyson in 2019. And he's, st and not, not to say he isn't relevant, like some people know him from the Adult Swim show, some people know him from The Hangover, but he was cracking jokes about Mike Tyson being a boxer. 
unless you watch Ip Man, there are a lot of people who don't know Mike Tyson was a boxer. As weird as that sounds, like, I know, I'm a 90s kid, so I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I knew that. But there are a lot of people who don't know him for that. And he's talking about stuff that's relevant to him being a boxer. And, and, or what happened while he, you know, he was a boxer. It doesn't make any sense. So just, just think about that. It's it literally, if you, if you can laugh at all of Family Guy's jokes, you'll love this. If you find yourself sometimes being like, when are they going to go back to talking about weed? Do not watch this special. All right. The last but not least are like the stuff you really need to check out on Netflix. So uh, first, we have uh, Fangbone, which is a really great comedy. I think that this is something that a parent can watch with their kid. It's about two guys, one from Earth, one from a parallel planet where they are essentially barbarians who fight monsters. And the monsters are now trying to get to Earth. So he comes, and they make friends, and they team up to beat this evil sorcerer and all of his monsters. Really simple concept, but really good. It feels like an old Disney cartoon, um, not like old school Disney, but like um, what, what you know, what was that one with the the, the robot? Or there's like this girl robot who helps you know deal with daily life, but she was a superhero. Yeah. There was another one where um, you know, fairy? yeah, the fairy thing. Like you know, we're talking about stuff that's like 2000s Disney's right after ju um, that's so Raven. That's what this show feels like, and it's 2019. So you know, it's pretty entertaining, pretty fun. Um, a lot of corny jokes throughout, and in general, it's it's like pretty much the Justice League when Aquaman is so out of touch with everyone else that you can't help but laugh. That's the main character of this show, Fangbo. Um, then there is also Countdown, uh, which is a movie that came out in theaters uh, the other week. It's pretty. It's a very simple concept, right? People download an app, and that tells you when it's gonna die, and how do you beat death when you only have a couple hours to live, right? Seems very cliche, very simple, whatever. I cannot tell you in the, how many years that I have seen a movie so simply using the basics of jump scare, you know, film, um, photog or filmography or whatever, cinematics, just like actually move an entire audience to jump up in their seats. It's not the, mo like the most interesting movie conceptually. Like I said, it's very redundant, but it literally scared people. It scared the audience. Even... Even Wolfie next to me had to jump. And it, it wasn't even so much the movie, but it was the audience reaction that would freak him out. That is what I'm talking about. If a movie is supposed to scare people and it scares people, it's done its job. It can be the corniest movie in the world. But if it was meant to be a horror flick and then you jump, it was a good movie. If it's meant to be a comedy and you laugh, I don't care if it's nothing but dad jokes. You laugh, it works. So this movie, he gets four out of five. But again, it's so basic. I can't give it a perfect score. It's not like we didn't see certain stuff coming. I, you knew who was going to die and who didn't. You knew the big twist at the ending. But along the way, whenever that monster showed up, you were like, oh, snap! So it was a solid move. It's a good October film just before the ending of October. And the only legitimate horror movie of October. Unless you want to count Joker just because, you, you know, he was a clown. Um, last but not least, Kengen Asha came out with part two. Now, I will give this a 4 out of 5, also because I'm not a huge fan of the CGI styling. It is one of the few series that make the CGI style of anime look decent. Um, but it definitely takes away from this being hand-drawn, where some of the fight scenes were better in the manga version of me. And it's very rare that I will say the manga art is better than anime art. The story all the time, because it gets more in-depth, but the art is better than you know the animation. Uh, the one thing about it, and another thing is why it's not a perfect score, is that the best part to Kengen Ashura for me, and for a lot of these short-term uh, action shonens, are that they get to the point, right? We get to the fighting. We, we, we get to the, you know, knowing who did this, that, and there without everything being stretched out. You might get one chapter about a character to tell their backstory one time. That's it. We're not finding out the, all these other side stories that are irrelevant that could be filled. No, we find out why they're fighting the way they're fighting, and then they get into the fight. And that's what the series does. This could have easily been done in two parts. The whole series done in two parts. And the way that they're pacing it, they're going to try and stretch it out into four. So for that, I also have to deduct some points just because it's like, hey, this being speedy as a series is what makes it hit so hard. I can tell you that this series was so good, I originally read half of it to, uh, to, to see the ending of it immediately in Vietnamese. Right? I don't know no Vietnamese. I found a way to read it in Vietnamese to get to, get to the conclusion. 
before it was ever translated into English because it was that good of a series. And because everything moved so quickly, it, you felt like, I need to see this now. Like, uh, you, you binged it. The greatest thing about this is that if Kengen Ashura is being developed for a four-part series, it's being developed to be a long series or, you know, over the next year or two, which gives them enough time as a manga, if it moves anything like the first series, to actually complete the sequel series, Kengen Omega. And I can tell you from where it's at right now, this series is probably even better than Kengen Ashura. So if we can, if Netflix is, is biding its time now on this one show, maybe we'll get all of it animated and we'll get an Omega series, which I think you guys will love even more. All right. So on that note, I'm your host, Bull D, and we will catch you guys. Excuse me, I'm next in line. Move. Excuse me, I'm next in line. Watch out. Excuse me, I'm next in line. I said move. Excuse me.